But I'm here now, so, um, well, uh, dear pedestrians, um, as president of the Swiss Pedestrian Association, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar called A Smart Transport Mode, How to Include Walking as an Obvious Choice. The webinar has been set up by Pedestrian Mobility Switzerland and the International Federation of Pedestrians together. With this webinar, we, could, we would like to invite you to discuss and think about ways to prioritize walking as a form of active mobility in politics, administration and in public. Walking is the most natural, healthy and environmentally friendly way to move. And yet this matter of fact has too little impact on the way pub how public space is planned and built. So in fact, the questions asked should not be ha about how to promote walking better, but how to succeed in giving it the right and also righteous amount of, um, of uh, attention in policy. As a member of the National Council of Switzerland, I can see in my everyday political work how even obvious choices can be subject to political will, for example, in an, an environmental politics. As on the road, the right of the strongest also applies in Parliament, and economic interests too often dominate the debate. May this webinar inspire and empower you in your activities to reframe this debate. Public space belongs to all of us, and policy should not be about the strongest, but, uh, but about the many. Thank you very much, and enjoy. Hello, uh, I'm Mario Alvin for the International Federation of Pedestrians. I'll be moderating the session. Uh, I start to apologize to Michael and Sarah. I didn't realize that I had to allow you in, but you are in now, so good to see you. Uh, and uh, next, uh, we will have uh, Monica that will make a short intro to the, um, to the webinar. Please, Monica, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Hello, everybody. My introduction is to this reframing webinar is focusing on a few basics about walkers and thoughts that consider walking as a public value. We all know it by heart. Put the walkers central in every kind of relevant walking policy. Make the walkers positively conspicuous. By using a model, our world inside and outside is structured like an iceberg. You have on the visible tops top aspects like concrete behaviors and structures. This, you see people walking in cities following specific rules and discipline. Children are playing rather on the playground than romping about streets in their neighborhood. Obviously the frames and the design to move freely and joyfully as humans on foot are mostly not given but restricted by the dominant mobility dictate. The needs which lie under the surface of every iceberg are not satisfied, but there lies the true power. People are craving for doing something meaningful. People are longing for social interaction. Everybody wants to be connected with others. Walkers are enjoying being active and experiencing their own well-being. In doing so, a walker is also practicing democracy while seeing others, different people, and while being seen in the streets. On the top of that, or the bottom, as a walker, you make a meaningful, meaningful contribution to the preservation of the natural basis of life. This the experience and the right to walk safely and happily is rooted deep in every human being, also in time of digital penetration. Our policies should acknowledge the walkers, enhance sustainable, people-friendly structures, and enable the options of corresponding lifestyles and dignified development. The next point I am addressing is more societal or common. Mobility is subjected to the concept of scarcity. This shows a value of mobility between economy and morality. The guidelines are money and subjective preference. Mobility was made into such a value a hundred year ago, a hundred years ago. Thereby, mobility can be used as a commodity or made scarce. There is no orientation to itself and to its effect on the public. The alignment is made 
with the expected instrumentalizations. Mobility becomes an object of speculation. We know the players, the car and oil industry, and a certain idea of freedom. Let's question this dominant car-centric fundamentals. I'd like to conceive walking as a practice oriented to itself, not to a shareholder value. Mobility as a practice is happening in public space. Therefore, it is important to realize once more that streets are public spaces. These nerves of every city are our living spaces. The last year has shown so impressively public spaces are an enormous resource, not only for people, but also important for cities and to society as such. A characteristic of public sp spaces are processes of inclusion and exclusion. They are manifesting along legal, economic, social and symbolic, symbolic dimensions. Mobilities are part of these processes. Most of the modes, namely car driving, are highly exclusionary and destructive. However, walking as a high, highly inclusive mode of mobility, sustainable, people-friendly, just. This means walking is contribu contributing not to more social justice and in doing so is generating a public value. Such a value is key for any space that wants to be public. Politicians in co-creation with public administrations private organization and civil society enable or prevent such public value. There can't be another goal for a public space than the importance for the societal social fabric and the shareholder value for the society. Walking holds this special value, therefore walking is far more than mobility. Thinking beyond mobility is possible. There is no need for superpower. Ask other questions instead of fighting within the dominant hierarchy of mobility for the first place. To turn the system around, we need to think outside the box for socially sustainable progress. Trying out these principles of reframing, I am starting with data. We know the slogan, what is counted counts, but we also know numbers only become impactful within relations and even more we know that facts alone related to context never convince people in addition we know the importance of story stories which trigger our emotions and which are the base of decisions this using existing data from switzerland we declare with emphasis walking benefits 900 million billion swiss francs every year to the society Driving does not bring a single franc, but is co costing us 9,617 billion Swiss francs every year. If there is data about external benefits of walking in your country, use it wisely and reframe it. A second possibility to revise data of walking, as far as I know, Switzerland was one of the first countries not only counting the routes as main mode of transport statistically, so based on, ex on existing data, we can discuss which answers lead to public value. Accordingly, stages certainly play a bigger role than distance and speed. The scarcity of time and space does not bring any value to public. Stages of the model split or other qualities are more meaningful. I'm thinking also about the time experienced when walking or riding a train. The perspective that presents destruction and costs to society and profit to private parties get us nothing. This by asking to what brings progress, we can question existence, existing references that are considered more important than other, like fact, fast, slow, far, close, less, more. In doing so, we can set a new frame of reference. Further, we can use the existing stage data of the model split and combine it with the density at places of residences. The denser a neighborhood, the higher the percentage of walking. Certainly, walking is also related to infrastructure, other qualities of public space and public transport for larger movements. This combination of data could be added to this data could be added that more than 50% of the households in the bigger cities 
do not own a car, rising trend and another paradigm shift. Local authorities have an interest in producing and offering little spaces of quality. As, national, as a national organization, we honor good design and infrastructure that allows walkers to move freely and respects walking as a public value. The focus of this prize has shifted over the last three decades a bit away from road safety to qualities of public spaces. The partnership we have with a magazine of design also contributes to the reframing process and allows to tell a positive story. Every catalyst of transformation knows about the importance of iteration. And we all know there is hardly a direct path to a destination. This means we have to be persistent and creative. Also, we can trust in the power of alliance, alliances. At the moment, we're observing new types of cooperation. Various public engagement is transform transforming realities. During the last year in the pocket park around the corner, maybe with methods of tactical urbanism or with a simple appropriation of a wall as a bench together or to have a break. These new partnerships behind the small ongoing transformations are often not officially established, but there is an important intangible quality, which also invites to look beyond mobility. Thank you for your invitation. This was the warm up, warm up, Gerd. Floor is yours. <laughs> Yes, um, thank you, Monica. Um, next will be uh, Geert from the International Federation of Pedestrians. Um, uh, yesterday, I asked uh, Monica to understand what she meant by meta mobility, and I think I get, got a good lesson here. I, I'm really fascinated by the subject. Uh, Geert, can you share your screen? And I forgot to tell you, uh, you can ask questions or in the Q and A or in the chat, and I will be. Um, summarizing to the speakers so put questions you have for the speakers and um they will we will have time to answer uh, in between presentations here you can start okay thank you mario am i uh, sharing my screen for the moment yes yes you're fine i can see you okay thank you so um uh, thank you uh, everyone um monica started talking about paradigms and i wanted to to just spend a few more minutes on paradigms and words and, and what they mean and how they affect our thinking. We are asked so often to talk about, uh, in, in, about protecting vulnerable road users in reports, in uh, webinars and whatever it is, but is that really what we want to do? When you look at this, I'm pretty sure that, there are, that you are not thinking, oh, we see five frames of vulnerable animals and one frame of normal uh, nature users. Uh, no, we, I mean, we don't talk about vulnerable animals, so why would we talk about vulnerable uh, road users? Don't misunderstand me. I don't want to start talking about car drivers as predators or something like that. But at least I would like to start by talking about active road users and not about vulnerable road users. It's more than just semantics. I think it is a mindset. So actually, when we talk about road safety, we shouldn't talk about protecting. Maybe when we talk about road danger, we could talk about protecting. But I would say let's stop protecting from danger. Let's just create safe conditions. And we all know that uh, for active road users, speed and space reallocation are a very important determinant of uh, road safety. Um, but one of the things we often forget is the user mix. And there is this very nice book from uh, Marco de Brommelstroot and uh, Talia Verkade, The Right of the Fastest. It's only in Dutch at this moment, but it is being translated at this very moment. And they are basically not looking so much at who are the victims uh, of our road system, but they're looking at which is the, the mode of the third party involved in fatal crashes here we're talking about fatal crashes and basically they find that 96 percent of the third parties are um, motorized vehicles so let's not forget modal shift is road safety 
Um, and let's invite um, low risk generators such as pedestrians, cyclists, and public transport users um, into the cities. What do we really want to do? We want to have the picture on the left where basically well protected children in high visibility are crossing a protected crosswalk in Sweden? Or do we just want to enjoy some tapas in Barcelona and have these little kids cycling around there unattended or attendant from a distance? So I want to stress we don't need to protect the vulnerable road users, we have to invite the active road users. We can even go a step, step further and when you Google safer roads, this is the screen you get. And work with me, who of you sees here a pedestrian or even a pedestrian or a cyclist infrastructure? I thought I had seen some uh, cyclist infrastructure on the top left, but actually this is motorcycle infrastructure. So a lot of people talking about safer roads and they show beautiful pictures and they show high speed. They don't mention anything about speed. They don't mention anything about sp uh, space reallocation. So should we think about safer roads? When we Google exactly the same thing, safer streets, safer streets, these are the first pictures you get uh, in Google a few days ago. What do we see? We see things about speed, we see people, we see safer streets for everyone, we see uh, some stuff about personal safety, uh, we see pedestrians, we see stronger economy, we see people. This is a totally different thing. So what would we be, what should we be thinking of about engineering safer roads? Or should we talk about streets and stronger economies and people and whatever uh, you can think about. So I would like to change our paradigm in inviting active street users or, or maybe active uh, public uh, space users. So do we want to have the, the, the situations on the left where we have those beautiful guard rails or in the middle where there even, even is a kind of a, a barbed wire uh, to keep pedestrians safe? Or do we want to have, like we see in New York, the plazas, uh, just kind of, these are inviting people. I remember when these plazas were installed in, um, in New York with very simple means to start off with. Uh, the, the, the person responsible for that, for that at the moment, uh, Janet Sadekan, says from, we were wondering whether the people would come and use these plazas. And she said, they popped up as, uh, like mushrooms after a rainy night. So that is really what you can do with, with, uh, with your infrastructure, with your inviting cities. So that brings us to the theme of our uh, webinar here, Smart the Transport Mode, how to include walking as an obvious choice. And I'm, I'm very happy, <coughs> excuse me, it's happening in, in many cities already, and we will have one, an example of one city that, uh, that does it since a while, quite good uh, about Bremen. Uh, that will be our next presenter. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hirt. Um, I also um, I insist that questions in the in the chat or in the Q and A. Um, we already have one from Ditter. Um, it says, Hirt, uh, I liked active users instead of vulnerable. Where should we act together to get this change done? Uh, we have about five minutes for answering some questions uh, while Michael can start uh, sharing his screen and then we'll talk a little bit about that. I remember that uh, we started, when I started uh, working on mobility, was non-motorized mode. So pedestrians and cyclists were characterized as what we were not, <laughs> which is not really a, a great term. Uh, Gert, where, where should we start uh, acting together to do this change? <laughs> well, first of all, I mean, we, we should, should every time use it. And, and if we're asked to talk about vulnerable road users, we should kind of uh, refuse or ask to change the title or whatever there is. Um, there is also some confusion on there. I mean, vulnerable road users is typically considered as motorcyclists, cyclists and pedestrians. Yes. And, and, and yes, motorcyclists are also vulnerable. Uh, and, and I'm not saying that pedestrians are not vulnerable in the current situation, but we, I mean, we don't want to go under this uh, umbrella of, of vulnerable road users. Uh, active road users, even there, there might be some, some uh, confusion. 
I mean, are that cyclists and pedestrians, or do you take public transport users also in there? You could talk about sustainable road users or, or street users or whatever you want to do there. But uh, but but for me, active road users uh, is, is typically pedestrians and cyclists, and 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 their range extender, which is public transport. <laughs> Thank you, Hirt. Um, yes, valuable road users or desirable road users. Just uh, use a term that uh, you know that. Uh, and actually, there is another uh, question because we are a little bit ahead of time. It's not a problem, which is uh, the fact that we are always uh, pedestrians and cyclists at the you know in reports we always speak about pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, it's a great alliance, uh, but uh, we have to recognize that we are very very different uh, users and. And I think that's something that we should be aware when we write reports or a paragraph in our reports that cyclists and pedestrians are very different from each other. Um, so I, please... I, fully, I fully agree with you, Mario. I mean, there are certain things where we uh, both benefit from. I mean, like you, you mentioned, uh, uh, road uh, traffic calming and things like that is very important for both cyclists and pedestrians. And I mean, and mm -hmm. I have. I prefer to have 100 cyclists than to have 100 uh, cars yeah. around me. So uh, yes, I mean we we are we are different, but uh, but but we are kind of uh, we we should be working together, and I think we do it quite well. We should be careful that when people think about active uh, road users, that they don't think 95% about cyclists and 5% about pedestrians. You're absolutely right in that. Good. Monica, uh, you spoke about the meta mobility and things that are not really valuable. One thing that fascinates me is about uh, pedestrians uh, adding social capital. You, I mean, you meet friends, you meet people that you don't see for a long time. That's something that during quarantine we missed a lot. So that's something that, you know, people can actually um, create ideas. And I think that's what cities are for. Would you like to uh, to speak a little bit about that? Uh, we still have a bit of five minutes uh, to keep our mm. our, yeah. our social capital, you know, in terms of people meeting each other in public space. It's actually something that is very difficult to value in the economic values, but it's uh, it's mm. actually what cities are for uh, to people actually to meet and to exchange ideas. Yeah, I think there are different aspects about it. On one hand, as I've spoken uh, about, I have spoken about public value. That's why I'm I'm always using this this notion. But you could also talk about uh, commoning, about the social capital. You can frame it in, in in different ways. The important thing is really what it or or or, or the the potential of the social potential of for a society. And as you told us before, yeah, there is no money in it, not visible money, but the value is way, way bigger than, than just money. And I think that's a possibility to escape this, this uh, money logic of mobility. And important for cities especially um, is social interactions, but also for, for the people, because after the, the the, the lockdown or in Switzerland it was half of a lockdown um, the people from the countryside young people old people they really they came to the city because they they were longing for social interactions they they like to perform just to be seen on stage and, and they, they had to check is society still alive am mm -hmm. I still alive and this this feeling and this desire is really strong I think it's really a need and it's you can see it in 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 in, in, in urban environments because it's also a quality of, of urbanic of urbanism, let's say like that. But it's also important in in um, on the countryside. There you have a smaller scale, but in the middle uh, at the core of every village, this kind of interaction is also important. I think it's um, good. good. Um, we have a question from Jenny to Hert. What alternative would you propose for pedestrian? Because a few people identify with that word uh, and depending in which language as well. And that's something that, uh, yeah, we talked a lot about in the International Federation of Pedestrians. Um, how we, pedestrians lack a political identity because we are 100%. But we are 100% of voters also. So, um, Kurt, what do you have to say as an alternative word for pedestrian? Well, okay, there's the obvious word walker, uh, and, and everyone has this kind of uh, preferences from 
from uh, do you prefer walker, walking, pedestrian? I mean, for me, it's kind of pedestrian is a little bit more uh, functional. If you want to walk, it can be a little bit more recreational. You think a little bit more about the about the countryside on a walker, even though in the city it's also a walker. So I mean. And, and then in different languages, you have different uh, terminologies. I mean, I can't care too much to be very honest, uh, but, but I, I mean, I, I'm open to, to whatever you propose there. <laughs> uh, Veronica um, uh, tell us that uh, I think we should check our recommendations in Austria, the National Action, Action Plan recommendation and so on, uh, and rephrase some formulations. And I think we are still going on about language, which language is very, very important when we're changing paradigm. Um, and at least rephrase expressions. Uh, also to integrate public value, social capital, and all that uh, things that we just talked about. Okay, I think uh, we are two minutes uh, early, which is fine, which is great. Uh, so Michael, can you just start speaking about your experience in Bremen? Yes, um, I'm on my way. Just, um, yeah, what I would like to do with you is, oops, now something is happening here. That should not happen. Um, I would like to take you to another facet of the uh, entire topic, and that's the link between a potato and space science. You may wonder how this comes together, but as soon as we talk about public space, you will see there are a lot of hot potatoes on the way. So with these words to start, I will uh, take you to Bremen. Bremen in the northwest of Germany, a harbor city, about half a million inhabitants just to set the scene. And uh, I love that photo, not only because it's showing our uh, central square, you see public transport, the tram is going through there slowly, but you have it there in the pedestrian area and you see the quality of space with that photo and maybe some people miss something and that's there are no cars and that's already showing the quality of space. Um, when it comes to the model split and Monica talked about it in the in the very beginning, um, this is the main mode of transport. So this is the model split of all our citizens over the entire city. And you see that the active modes um, are about half of all trips. So it's not something small. And this is a figure. I assume that now this might be even higher. When it comes to the central areas, we talk about 60% of all trips done by active modes. So again, it depends also on the fabric of the city. And seeing cycling and walking, and this was also um, now topic of, of, of um, one of the discussions. Of course, there are things that come together. Here we see we're doing quite a number of things to improve cycling. And this is um, highly recognized. You can see numbers climbing up. Um, of cyclists, and sometimes also you can see how pedestrians benefit from it. Here an example um, that we had previously separated small bike paths, but very close to another small sidewalk. And we changed it to a cycle priority street. So everything that has wheels is on the lane. We don't call it car lane, it's the lane. And you see the benefit, and it's also more flexible for cyclists. And we have up to 8,000 cyclists a day and 4,500 cars. So you see that you can change things and even make it better also then with side effects on the sidewalks. But that's not why it's called side effect. So conditions for walking, and I took you a little bit from heaven, now I take you to hell, if you want to say so, because it's also our city and it, let's say it, this picture that you see now, this was a situation before we changed something. And I um, would like to show you this picture. You see here the, the mom with a child at the hand and then next photo, you see she has to take the kid on the arm 
to get along this parked car. And maybe I have to also change some of the stereotypes you may have about Germany and Germans. It's probably true that a lot of people as pedestrians wait in the middle of the night at a red traffic light, even though there's no car coming. But as soon as it comes to parking, we are more wild west than keeping the rules. So, um, so this is all reality. For luck, this is a before situation. And also here we have shared space, although it was never declared to be because otherwise you can't walk side by side. But the other fact is when we look at the surveys, 26% of the cars here in these areas are not moved in within three consecutive days. So these are not cars that need to be the tool to get to work every morning, but these are for pleasure purposes, to visit someone and so on and so forth of the coin and now it comes to an absolute no-go if there are problems for the firefighters because of parked cars so space science for us means to reduce the number of cars if you want to reclaim street space that's what it comes down to at the end of the day and that's where it comes down to. and this is really uh, the hot potato um, can you see the slides? I just see that someone says, I, I cannot see the slides. Moving on. Yes, we can. I, I can okay, then, then it's I not the problem on my side. So reducing number of cars, that's the hot, the hot topic. And when you come to discuss um, these issues, it's also a question, whom are you going to involve in participation? The usual format are assemblies in the evenings. This is not the usual format where you can get families to because they have to take care for the kids. You don't get the kids themselves. So what we did in participation, we got on the road. We got into the streets and we wanted to talk to people there. And um, then you are able also to involve families. You are able to involve people with kids and you get also different pictures than the usual formats, uh, the conventional traditional formats of evening assemblies. And that's the word cloud um, that uh, came out of our uh, participation process. And you see illegal parking is number one, but parking pressure, of course, the other side of the coin that people say, hmm, where shall I park is also a problem. And that's the problem in limited street space. Yeah, and also when we made, when we created the plans, we also, before, we um, got to the political committees. We again had meetings on the road. We presented the plans on the road. That was on a weekend, um, six sessions of, on two days with two teams. And so we were in almost every street, even with bad weather. And the bad weather was even good for the quality of the debate because people said, wow, that you come out of your office, of your warm office into the street highly welcome, although I have a different opinion on the topic. So it changed the culture of communication. And also what you see, you get handicapped people there. Usually they're not so well represented in the usual formats. So take this also into account in your process. And then in uh, August last year with the plans, um, we disseminated by bulk mail a brochure uh, showing uh, what's residential parking, statements of stakeholders, and what are alternative mobility options as well. So why it's done and what is done. Um, we said also the why. We said, oh, look at people who are handicapped or look at the, what, the, the ones who have to collect your waste and also um, the rules that are clear and otherwise it will be enforced. Yeah, we started in uh, October last year and uh, made clear markings on the street where to park. So although it's usually clear according to the highway code, but it's better to show it very clearly. And then also another German disease is to have bollards everywhere, which usually limit then the sidewalk as well. Here you can see we put uh, bike racks on the other side of the curb, so on the lane. Um, so that 
it's clear there's no car parking, there's more space for big vehicles, and if you are not reducing the space for pedestrians. Here also before and after, you see more space, fewer cars. Enforcement, oops, enforcement um, also uh, that took about 10 days, two weeks, and then let's say people learned that it's meant seriously to have rules. Um, what are the strategies that we offered? Uh, cargo bike sharing is one point, uh, more bike parking, of course, car sharing, uh, because car sharing in Bremen is a tool to reduce car ownership. Every car sharing car takes 16 cars off the road. And Udo, our little hero, stands for use it, don't own it. He prefers to chill instead of changing winter tires and all that kind of stuff. And you see the type of car sharing stations that we implement in these neighborhoods. It's growing uh, very well. We have 20,000 users, but more important that they took off uh, 6,000 cars off the road. So when we uh, look at the results in that neighborhood, 1.6 kilometers of sidewalks are usable again. And I love that photo because it shows so clearly why it's necessary to reorganize the street space. And But we took out about 100 cars. And this is our fan club as well. Yuri from Omsk and his uh, waste collecting team, they say now our life is much easier. We're saving time and this is our work time. So also think of these people and they are supporters of your ideas. But reactions are, of course, also there that people say this is all bullshit. Where shall we park? So that's um, very ongoing, intense debate in the media as well. And also, we see reactions in windows that people say this is a very good solution. Finally, no parking on street. So this is very controversial still. It's a hot potato that someone needs to touch and to start and to cook this potato. And uh, then there will be a good solution. So that's the little report from Bremen. And I hope to see you and we will take a walk then here and you see what are the changes. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Michael. Uh, excellent uh, presentation. Um, we have a very active uh, chat here. Um, let me go through some of the questions. Jenny um, asked a very interesting question that a lot of activists and advocates of pedestrians ask, and cyclists also. Should we rephrase our goal in... Uh, should we rephrase that our goal is to reduce the number of cars with something like increase the quality of life so be be positive instead of negative i think that's what it means uh, but then is it clear enough what we need to be done i think this is a very uh, question that a lot of activists struggle uh, shall we yeah. go for a negative message or just for positive message michael well, it's, it's the same thing as as in a debate that we had a couple of minutes ago um you have to be clear uh what your goals are um and the the goals are not primarily to reduce the cars that's only the tool um yeah um we have any way to reshape mobility for the future um we have a number of tasks that uh, have to be fulfilled uh, in street space that's not only transport function and i include in transport function also walking and cycling and uh, all the other modes but there is communications there is it's a social space for children to play in front of the uh, house and one thing that we also have to take into account is climate adaptation that becomes more and more important just to make reference to Vienna and cool streets. Yeah. yeah? Um, so there is more. Um, we here in the north, we don't have so much the problem of heat. It's coming. We have more torrential rain sometimes. So also there we have to deal with and to reshape street space because of these reasons. And um, Street space is extremely limited and a, a scarce resource, and uh, nobody wants to live on a on a parking lot. So to bring this together, and it's always a kind of compromise, and you won't be everybody's darling, especially when you're dealing with these strategies. That's also clear, and uh, you need brave politicians, but also you have to do your communication, as I tried to show, in a way that's more dedicated 
that you involve these groups yeah i call them now also again vulnerable that they raise their voice because usually these vulnerable groups are not well heard the strong groups are the ones that can express themselves much better yes yes thank you uh sylvian um says free up space for park cars necessary uh i think in a way it's just what everybody knows that uh, public space is a zero-sum game, you know, uh, if cars are there, pedestrians have less space. Uh, in the example shown, where do the cars go? I think that's uh, something yep. that a lot of people were thinking about. Um, displacement uh, of parking uh, or shared mobility proposals, measures to promote public transport and so on. What is the role of public institutions in the management of uh, parking spaces in public space? Mm -hmm. And this yeah. also goes to another question that is related uh, by Maja, uh, say, thanks for the interesting presentations. Question, where does the number of 16 cars removed for, per shared car come from? I think these okay. two questions can be answered. I, I, I start with the last point. Uh, Maya, if, if you like, I can send you the study it's a study that was carried out 2017-2018, so all before this corona um, impacts. And um, it's a very uh, in-depth study. We also analyzed things like uh, shopping behavior. For instance, 80% of the car sharers in Bremen don't have a car in the household, so it's replacing the first car. And um, the frequency of going to big shopping centers by this group is only a fourth, yeah, 25% of the reference group. So people do more shopping in their neighborhood and in the city center. So these are all things you can find in the study and I'm, I'm happy to share that um, um, either, um, I don't know whether there will be any documentation of, of today. I can put the link there, otherwise just drop me an email um, and I will send you the reference case. Uh, where do the cars go? Um, you cannot expect that you can provide alternative parking in the same quantity. That's very clear. So you have to be clear on that as well. Um, first of all, shared mobility is uh, a crucial point to reduce the number of cars as I tried to show. Bremen is a cycling city. So to improve cycling conditions is in these inner city neighborhoods more important when it comes to the periphery there's, of course, a higher role of public transport, but here you have everything nearby, and this is rather walking and cycling distance. I rather call it the 10-minute city than the 15-minute city when you have uh, these, um, this kind of setting uh, of the neighborhoods. Um, so, and the, the, the other point is also um, we had a lot of free parking, so free use of so you don't have to you didn't have to pay now you have to pay and this also um helps to bring people into parking garages because there you usually have to pay but there's something that people always try to save one or two euros and uh or three euros or whatever it is but now as you have to pay and you as a visitor you can park only there for maximum two hours uh, then people go also in existing parking garages which were not so much used before Excellent. Uh, Michael, uh, two questions that are also for Veronica about the um, Austrian uh, strategy. Are those documents in English? Because a lot of our listeners... Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, have, okay. we have it in uh, German and English, so whatever you excellent. prefer, you excellent. can get it. Excellent. If you shared with us, we also will share in our social media. So please uh, accompany the International Federation of Pedestrians or the Swiss um, Association of Pedestrians, and then uh, we will share with you all the data and uh, reports that we've been sharing here. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, there was a shout out from um, Hirt about uh, how nice it is to see charging places outside the sidewalk, which is something that is a tsunami coming to Europe, another uh, continent. So I think it's very, very important that we protect our sidewalks. Uh, and then uh, Dieter speaks a shout out on uh, Barcelona superblocks, which is uh, uh, basically environmental areas that are protected from motorized traffic and is more towards uh, uh, children and and uh, walkers. And uh, Geert also speaks about um, 
uh, pedestrian parking, the importance of benches, especially in Europe where the population is getting older and older. I have a 101 year old father and he goes to the supermarket because he has a bench between his house and the supermarket. He told me that yesterday. So um, my homage to him now. Um, okay, so now um, we have um, Sarah that will speak about the role and the importance uh, of legal frameworks uh, on international level. <laughs> So, hello everyone, thank you for giving me the, giving me the floor. So, um, I'm going to talk, uh, as Mario just said, about uh, international road safety regulation and the importance to, to, um, to include and to promote walking when it comes to, to frame and to define these regulations. So, it's also going to be a little bit about uh, a case study because I'm going to um, talk about my experience as, the, um, as a delegate for IFP at the WP1, which is a place where international regulation on road safety are discussed and uh, defined. So um, what are we talking about? What are these international regulations on road traffic and on road safety? Here on the slide, you can see um, an extract of the 1968 Vienna Convention. And this is one of the main legal instruments at the international level, which defines traffic rules and road users' behaviors. So here you can see, for instance, uh, chapter two, rules of the road. And uh, you have uh, some very basic stuff about the fact, for instance, that road user must comply with the instruction conveyed by road sign and signals or other rules, such as the fact that uh, pedestrian should use uh, the sidewalk when there is one, etc., etc. So this is an example. Um, of a reg an international regulation, which is uh, very important in many countries, in many national states. Uh, the Vienna Convention is, um, is at the basis of the, um, the traffic rules in many, many national states. So where are the, the places where this uh, international regulation about road traffic and road safety are defined? First, um, the United Nations uh, organization is a very important place where those conventions are discussed, and in particular um, at the UNECE, which is the, um, the, the agency for Europe of the United Nations, and more precisely at the WP1, the Global Forum for Road Traffic Safety, which is um, a working party uh, where um, where we discuss about the, the 1949 and the 1968 Convention on Road Traffic and on other UN resolution on road safety. And of course, there is also at the European level, I would say, uh, the, Euro the European Commission and the European Parliament, uh, where there are many um, regulations on road safety that are uh, discussed and defined. For instance, the general safety regulation, which defines the safety features of vehicles that are mandatory in the, in the European Union. So all these um, conventions, agreements, resolutions have a really have a very um, real impact on our daily mobility practices, on how road use is organized and orchestrated, and on what we ought to do or what we shouldn't do as uh, road users. So these tools define rules, standards, best practices regarding. Um, road users' behaviors, road infrastructures, vehicle safety features, licenses, etc. So we can really say that they shape the way in which road safety is, um, is um, envisioned and performed. So um, they also have a, a huge importance for pedestrians and for walking in general. So it is very important to have a seat at the negotiating table and to um, to participate, to help frame these legal instruments and make the voice of an interest of pedestrians heard. So now I will uh, talk a little bit more about my experience as the delegate of the IFP at the WP1, which is the Global Forum for Road Traffic Safety. So 
first, a few words about the, the WP1. So the WP1 um, is the guardian of UN road safety related legal instruments and more precisely is the guardian of uh, the conventions on road traffic and road traffic safety. It's a working party that gathers uh, delegates from, um, from countries that are contracting parties to this convention that, so that they have agreed on this convention and um, those delegates from um, those states they gather twice a year in geneva to to discuss uh, and to amend and update those legal instruments and there are also non-governmental actors such as ngos uh, but also representatives from industries for instance the car industry or um, or expert from academia or from other UN agencies that are uh, attending those um, those uh, meetings and that are also contributing to 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 produce the legal legal instruments. Um, <clears throat> so maybe it's also important to to underline that the Convention on Road Traffic they were. Uh, created in the post-war context where when the ownership um, of cars and the motorization of Europe was uh, at its peak. So it's also very, very important to, to, to stress that um, these tools were uh, built in such a context and um, even though um, these legal instruments are considered as very valuable instruments that should be revised very carefully. Um, there is nevertheless the sense that um, these regulations should be updated uh, to embrace the technological changes, the new mobility practices are a thing that is very important at the UN level at the moment, the sustainable development goals. So now I will give uh, two examples of uh, the intervention of uh, IFP in these meetings. Um, so first, I will talk about um, an intervention I made on autonomous driving. So autonomous driving is a very important topic for the WP1 at the moment, because uh, those autom automated vehicles are um, are are slowly coming to our countries and we need uh, regulations for these vehicles um, so of course we talk still a lot about cars at the wp1 um, and uh, it's sometimes a bit frustrating for us i think but nevertheless it's a very important issues uh, issue and this issue has also very important implications for pedestrians for instance uh, there is a resolution on which we, we worked and uh, this resolution was about the question should autom automated vehicles um, be required to signal their mode of op operation to other road users. So basically to, add, to indicate to other road users that the, that the automated driving mode is activated. And um, as the delegate of the IFP, I took the floor to express the fact that um, we were a bit uh, fearing um, that there would be um, a lot of confusion and a risk of a cognitive overload for pedestrians if, um, if those vehicles start to use different types of lights to indicate different type of messages, for instance, uh, as you can see in the picture here. Um, yeah, at the moment, many research centers are developing uh, communication interfaces in order for these vehicles to indicate what, they are, what are their intentions to other road users. And uh, as the IFP, um, we, we just raised the awareness of the WP1 on the fact that this could lead to a cognitive overload for pedestrians when they want to cross the, the street to have to, to decipher and to, to decode all these messages from cars. So I think this is a very uh, important topic for, for us on which we have a very important uh, contribution to make. 
Another example where um, I intervene at the WP1 is a, is an, is a case in which we, we started discussing the, the issue of uh, distracted driving and in particular the fact that uh, investigation in case of a crash should be conducted on, on smartphone uses to, to see if the, the driver of the car was distracted at the moment of the crash. And the, um, the discussion about distracted driving started to, to slowly uh, drift to, the, to the, the question of distracted walking. And uh, it was raised during this discussion that uh, pedestrians were also distracted and that they should also, and that these rules should also apply to them. And um, at that moment, I took the floor to just to intervene to, to say that for us, distracted walking um, cannot be compared to distracted driving because um, the, the responsibility of driver, uh, drivers is very different than, the, that, than that of a pedestrian. For instance, drivers are moving a ton of metal around them at a very elevated speed. And for that, they must have a license. They must prove their ability, their mental and physical ability to do so, whereas pedestrians don't. And um, for us, walking is a, is a basic human right. And, um, and walking is practiced by all kinds of bodies and um, by all kinds of uh, neurodiverse uh, people. And this distraction somehow will always be a part of it. So instead of trying to educate pedestrians um, to be less distracted, it's probably better to put our energy to create a public space that is forgiving of, um, of those um, moments of distraction that could occur. Um, last. Sarah, can you round up in one minute, one minute, please? Uh, yes, sure, of course, excuse me. <laughs> so the last slide, this is my last slide, just to mention that we are, the IFP is also active at the European level. This is um, something that my colleagues Mario and Gert uh, are doing. And for instance, I will just give a brief example. Um, they are, for instance, um, um, writing um, comments and amendments on the, the, EU, the European Union policy on, um, on safety and also intervening on the implementation of uh, new technologies, for instance, the Intelligent Speed Assistance, the ISA, to make sure that this uh, new um, technical uh, regulation will be applied in, in the best possible way and as it was uh, discussed at the beginning. So, this is all for me. Sorry if I took a little bit more time. And okay. uh, just to conclude, I just want to say that um, it's very important for us to have uh, the voice of pedestrians being uh, heard at these meetings um, and to provide another narrative on mobility and on road safety uh, in those settings. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, <laughs> It's, uh, it's, it's echo. Uh, it's there echo. is echo. There is I don't echo. know why. There is a lot of echo on my side. Okay. Um, thank you, Sarah. It's always very uh, good, and uh, it's never enough to um, remind everyone of the importance uh, of Sarah's work in the front lines. Uh, it's always good to hear the news in the front lines. Uh, it's very, very important. Um, there is a question from Jenny. Uh, what would be the next step? Uh, uh, or goal to reach in order that the United Nations road safety stakeholders join the new paradigm about walking. Uh, uh, meanwhile, I apologize to Alessandra that uh, I had it uh, under my panel, but I'm not used to this interface and I just got, uh, she had to wait for me to let her in. So, uh, Alexandra, you can start uh, checking your screen and sharing your screen while uh, we uh, talk with, uh, with Sarah to answer this question. Please, Sarah, what will be the next step you think we should? Be taken. Well, that's a difficult question. Um, I think next step. I mean, at the WP one, it's uh, already a big step for us to to have this voice uh, expressed and heard. Uh, it's difficult to know um, if we are if they listen to us and if uh, uh, what is exactly the impact 
we have on the decision that are made. But uh, yes, I think um, the next step is really to to continue this um, this uh, lobbying action and to to try really to to create al alliances, as uh, as Monica also said in our presentation. To find the good alliances with um, with delegates um, to to really have our uh, action uh, also um, uh, taken on the floor by uh, national delegates and stuff like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's really a diplomacy work. Uh, we do <laughs> know that uh, Sarah has those qualities, and I think we that's key to create alliances among the delegates. Uh, just uh, before Alessandra starts, Renata from uh, EPFL uh, of Lausanne says that we do have researches on benches, but uh, the results are still to be published. Meanwhile, Michael uh, uh, published on the chat uh, the P PDFs about the car sharing. And um, thank you, Renata, uh, just to tell you that uh, you made such a good point on the police uh, webinar that I print the screen and I shared the, that point with other people. So I do appreciate that you are here and uh, that you will be sharing the results uh, on benches of PSL because it's a very important topic. Um, so um, now Alessandra should start. We are a little bit late, but uh, I think we should be okay. Alexandra, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hello um, to everybody. I'm happy to be here. My name is Alessandra Angelini from the Environmental Agency of Austria. And I'm here uh, today to present uh, the need for a walking strategy, the so-called master plan walking. And I'm really happy about the previous presentation, especially um, the presentation of Bremen uh, with the great picture where it's shown uh, the problems that we're facing uh, in urban um, areas uh, to promote also walking infrastructure. So um, I will start with the question, why do we need a master plan for walking? And I will read this out like kind of a creator for a deliberation. I mean, we all know that uh, walking is really environmental friendly, it's health, it's good for the fitness, and actually it's really good it's a pure pleasure walking. So um, many cities also considered walking as important, which is a really great starting point um, for this transport mode. But uh, in order to promote walking on the municipality level, uh, it has to be integrated into the policies, so into the transport mobility policies and into city policies with on the basis uh, with other transport modes. And by doing so, it's necessary or well, actually, it's to give great importance to walking and by integrating this transport mode in the transportation system, also on the municipality and local level, um, an overall framework is necessary um, well, on the national level. And therefore, a strategic document like the master plan walking is needed. And so far on the national level, just a very, very few countries have developed strategies to promote walking. By the way, Austria is one of the countries and I will present you through um, uh, presentation the main fields of action of this master plan and within the PAP a major step is also set forward to promote active mobility and to put this transport mode in the forefront of the transport mobility policies. <laughs> So uh, what are the main problems that we have to tackle within a master plan walking within a strategic uh, document? What are the main fields of action? We have these unattractive urban spaces, so we have to foster pedestrian friendly uh, traffic and urban planning, and we have to improve the walking infrastructure and we need uh, investment initiatives for the improvement. And that brings us to the second main key factor um, uh, and, and, and starting point that we are facing Facing a lack of institutional framework and funding. So we have insufficient financial resources. And um, we can, what we can do also within this overall framework of a national master plan walking, we can increase the cooperation at the different levels, so the national, regional, and municipal municipality level, and uh, we can uh, create uh, financial support programs to promote the walking infrastructure, which is really, really necessary. 
Third point uh, is that walking is not on an equal footing with other transport modes. And um, what can we do against it? We can uh, raise the awareness of this transport mode. We can integrate walking into the transportation system by establishing links between the public transport and walking. And we can uh, optimize our, uh, yeah, the, the legal framework to improve the pedestrian safety, the road safety. And there's a lack of data and research. I think this was also mentioned already. Data on walking is not an, uh, adequately recorded and it's um, kind of normally so is underestimated by 1.5 times. So there's also a lot of work to do to generate a high quality database. Uh, we have tackled uh, these um, problems and this field of action within uh, our master plan walking in Austria. This walking initiative was uh, elaborated in 2015 and the main aim is on the one hand to raise the awareness of this transport mode and to take better account of the needs of the pedestrian on the um, regional, federal and on the municipality level in all kind of decision making processes. And uh, the master plan walking, uh, you can uh, uh, download it under the link uh, uh, in, in this um, uh, PowerPoint slide. It uh, contains 10 fields of action with 26 concrete measures. And um, to give you a short overview of what happened till the elaboration of this master plan walking uh, since 2015, so what happened in the last five to six years um, in Austria, so walking is uh, first of all integrated in the Austrian National Energy and Climate Plan and in the coalition agreement of the Austrian government. So there's a special focus on active mobility set in these documents. And we have also a, a climate protection initiative. It's called Klima Aktiv Mobil uh, from the Federal Ministry of Republic of Austria. And uh, they have launched this year a financial support program to promote working infrastructure. So there is a funding for working infrastructure now available. Um, we have established a nationwide working and coordination group on walking um, uh, and there are different members, uh, for example, representative of the federal government, the federal states, cities and municipalities, and there are also various um, uh, stakeholders from organizations and interest groups, and there we are uh, kind of well, we, we are coordinating the different interests of walking and uh, we also uh, elaborated uh, some pedestrian friendly changes to road traffic regulation within this uh, working group on walking. So, for example, we banned the scooters for the sidewalks. We also had some regulation about school streets, for example, and uh, we are still working on improving the road safety within the legal framework. And um, last but not least, um, um, nowadays uh, the mass upon walking at the level of a city region um, of the city of Salzburg is uh, under elaboration. So uh, it's still in development and it will be presented within this year. So I think in Aachen 2021, it will present the first um, document on the city and region level. With that said, I thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, before giving um, the floor to Gert and Monica that they will warp up uh, the, this session that is almost over with the conclusions, uh, I will just point out that uh, Marja from Mor Norway, I would think, says that they have a, a project, uh, Walk More, for uh, walking in small Norwegian cities. And she makes a point that is very, very important, is that uh, a lot of funding for research is always very much focused on technology. Mm -hmm. And um, and she uh, points out that uh, walking is actually quite um can be quite good for smart mobility solution as a actually there is like a walking as a service uh, almost as a joke that's something that could be could be a point of selling but anyway uh, i think we should also not go so, <laughs> through this uh, bite of technology but i think monica has something to say about that too so monica and her can you just uh, conclude and i think there is some links on the on the chat and um and thank you everybody to uh, to be here and to participate to the questions oh yes um christian uh, on the question q a uh, 
uh, it was the only one that used the Q&A, asked if he could uh, get the presentation from Gert and from everybody. Um, maybe Monica can address these questions about, this will be uh, recorded and shared, and I think the, the presentations also. Monica, Gert? Yes, exactly. There will be a, um, a link, I don't know, next week to, to uh, re-watch revise all the presentations. And um, just one or two things from my side. Thank you very much, everybody, for particip participating. I think there are a lot of questions and uh, a lot of energy is also in the room to, to move forward and to really reframe and and um, reframe walking. For me, it's certainly a question, where are all these steps leading to? Can we really, really, really convince the real politic to follow? It's one of the, my main questions. And uh, maybe the other question or the other questions, what kind of transformation is, is really possible? Is there a certain momentum at the time or is it not? How and how um, or what kind of collaboration partnership would be useful, useful for us? I don't know, we're here from mainly from mobility side, I think a few of, of the listeners are also from, from the health side, but maybe we have to ask ourselves, yeah, what kind of partnership could also be useful for us to move forward? These are the questions in my head and I thank you very much. I, I give uh, the floor to Gerd. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Monica. I, I just want to conclude here by, by thanking, of course, all the, the speakers. Uh, Mariona's uh, welcome, uh, Monica, who reminded us of that, that walking is much more than mobility, but basically is a public value. Uh, I just quickly touched on the paradigms and the words, and, and I hope I don't hear the vulnerable thing too, too often anymore. Uh, Michael, you gave us some, some great insights in, in what a city can do, and, and, uh, and also uh, I was also the interesting chat and, 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 and the references given and so on. Um, you showed us uh, some hell and you showed us some, uh, some heaven. Actually, during the presentation, I was watching outside my window and this is what I saw. I'm not sure whether you can see it. Uh, yes, you can. So that's basically, you have the bike lane, you have the sidewalk and you have this, uh, this, this uh, money delivery truck that basically blocks the whole thing. And we have been with the neighborhood committee already mentioning it so many times and even even police is parking there. So that's one of the things we did not touch today. It's about enforcement and maybe that's another seminar we should do another day. Uh, but anyhow, I mean, the other topic we covered was all the importance of the rules and regulation. And thank you, Sarah, for bringing us uh, on, on some, some, some better insights in, in why it is important to also work on rules and regulations that might seem not so much for pedestrians, but more car oriented and things like that. Uh, so you, you explained that very well. And, and Alessandra, thank you for, uh, for giving all the insights in, in the needs uh, of a walking plan and what should be in that walking plan. So with that, I would like to conclude. I think this was a, uh, a valuable session. And um, thank you, Mario, for uh, moderating this whole thing uh, so well and, and uh, keep us on track. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. And uh, just to point out that Dieter, one of our members, has a conference uh, and uh, you will find the details on the chat. And uh, there will be some of uh, Michael, I think, will be there and other people and the Salzburg uh, uh, plan will be there as well. So thank you very much and I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.